Thank you to the Alumni Association for inviting me to be here today. I'm honored to talk to you about uh, my recently published book, Courage to Dissent, uh, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement. Although, um, I must say that after listening to all of the news reports this morning, I almost feel as if I should talk to you about the royal wedding. Um, <laughs> although, I can't think of how to relate that to civil rights. Uh, so I, I think that I should probably just uh, carry on with my plans. Um, let me begin by explaining the book's conceptual framework. And I'll do that by uh, posing a question. And that question is, what would the story of the 20th century struggle for civil rights look like if legal historians decentered the work of the legendary Thurgood Marshall and the familiar cases that he won before the Supreme Court and instead looked at the struggle for civil rights from the bottom up? What would we see? Who would we see? Now, even as I pose that question, I realize that it might sound odd, especially odd coming from the Thurgood Marshall professor of law. Uh, why should I want to make uh, the legendary lawyer less prominent in the struggle for civil rights? Well, certainly it's not because I think that uh, Justice Marshall was unimportant or uh, because I think the work of the court was unimportant, far from it. Uh, rather, I take this point of departure because I think there's so much more that we can learn about who contributed to the social and legal world that we inhabit today. Moreover, it turns out that some people disagreed with Marshall's perspective on civil rights, and I think it deepens our understanding of constitutional history and the social history of the civil rights era to try to figure out what those perspectives were and why people disagreed. So that's my framework. It's a bottom-up history on constitutional uh, law with a view towards a deeper understanding of the relationships among the civil rights bar, the courts, and the national and local civil rights movement. Now, the next question is, who else is there? Who else was there uh, other than Thurgood Marshall? Now, I brought along some slides with the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, as I discuss, one of the lawyers who is a very prominent subject in my book, the book talks about uh, a number of figures, uh, but I'm going to focus on uh, a particular uh, gentleman today, a truly pioneering lawyer by the name of Austin Thomas Walden, A.T. Walden, who was one of the South's first African-American lawyers. He was the son of former slaves and sharecroppers. He uh, grew up, was born in rural Georgia. From this humble background, he went on to attend the University of Michigan Law School. He graduated with honors while he uh, waited tables for a local fraternity. He became a well-respected Atlanta lawyer. His practice included handling corporate matters for uh, black banks uh, in Atlanta. He also did race work. He founded uh, a bar association for the small number of black lawyers in Atlanta during the post-war era. They were excluded from the white bar association. He also represented black defendants in court, which was quite something at this time. He was the first black man to aid in the prosecution of a white terror group in Georgia. And he also collaborated with Thurgood Marshall and the National NAACP. Now, publicly, Walden promised allegiance to Marshall's strategy for achieving civil rights, so this all-out struggle against Jim Crow. But in practice, it turns out, uh, the picture was a little bit different. He crafted an approach to civil rights that fit local circumstances. And for that reason, uh, I learned when I first started this project many years ago, Walden had a mixed reputation. His reputation was tarnished because of the ways in which he had deviated from Marshall's approach. He was called an accommodationist or an Uncle Tom. Of course, this label was used to describe people who were perceived as too fearful 
um, are too self-interested mm -hmm. to oppose Jim Crow. Now, I take a different view. My work challenges this view of Walden and others like him. I argue that Walden's contribution ought to be appreciated no less than Marshall's. I argue that he was a pragmatist, that he had a pragmatic approach to civil rights, meaning that he certainly did make compromises, but those compromises don't necessarily imply that he was unprincipled. In fact, he was quite activist in some areas, and let me explain. Above all else, prag pragmatists like Walden, uh, along with some black college presidents, local businessmen, uh, lawyers and doctors prioritized voting rights as the path to uh, individual rights and property rights. So here we have in this slide Walden there in the background in the hat challenging the white primary, which w was the uh, convention, the laws throughout the South of excluding uh, blacks from voting. At risk of his life there, he uh, voted in Georgia's Democratic primary after the Supreme Court's ruling in Smith versus Allwright, which held that uh, Texas's white primary was unconstitutional. And here was, here's the result of his activism. In 1946, where blacks lined up all along the streets in Georgia uh, to exercise the franchise. Walden was a sort of a political boss in Georgia. He could turn out the black vote, and it was because of him that this man on the uh, left here, Leroy Johnson, was the first uh, black state senator elected in Georgia uh, since Reconstruction in 1962. So he paved the way for the election of uh, many other African Americans. Now, so he was very active on the voting rights front. But all of this activism could not save his reputation. He was still called an accommodationist. So the question is, why was this? Well, it was largely because his, of, his, of his decision making with respect to housing and education. The national NAACP favored an all-out attack on housing after the Supreme Court's ruling in Shelley versus Kramer, which was the decision saying that judges could not enforce racially restrictive covenants. But Walden did not challenge uh, housing segregation after this decision. Instead, he and the local uh, Urban League in Atlanta made deals with the white power structure to find black housing wherever they could. And this was in the wake of a housing crisis after World War II. Now, Walden claimed that making these deals was best for the entire black community. But as it turned out, black realtors, bankers, builders, um, actually profited from having all black markets, all black neighborhoods, but not everyone profited from these segregated neighborhoods. So consider this woman um, who lived in a very impoverished neighborhood. Um, Walden's deals kept neighborhoods like this intact, and uh, so his deals had negative long-term consequences. What about education? Well, there are two contexts in which he made bargains. The first was K through 12 education, where Walden never fully embraced school desegregation. Why was this? Well, mostly out of a concern for preserving black teachers' jobs, but also, he said, out of a concern for black students. He thought they might not uh, have nurturing environments in desegregated schools. So he was quoted in the New York Times in 1954 as advising blacks to move slowly in implementing Brown. And slowly he went. He did not file a case to implement Brown until 1958, although he told Thurgood Marshall um, that he would file a case uh, by 1955. 
It fell to NAACP lawyer Constance Baker Motley, shown here, to take over the Atlanta school case as lead counsel. Um, she filed the case, she litigated it, and she said, quote, constitutional rights of black children could not be made forever contingent on the preferences of whites. She litigated the case very aggressively, and as a result, um, the school children here, the Atlanta Nine, uh, desegregated the schools in 1961. What about higher education? Well, uh, Walden initially filed a case to desegregate the University of Georgia in 1952, um, but he was replaced as lead counsel on that case, uh, be again, because the national NAACP believed he was, quote, too beholden to the white power structure to aggressively prosecute the case. And here we see him pictured with Horace Ward in the middle there. He became a, a federal district court judge. He was the initial plaintiff in the Georgia case. Um, he was replaced by Dunn Hollowell, who's pictured there on the right, um, and Constance Baker Motley, uh, who took over again. Motley, in 1961, 11 years after uh, Walden initially filed that case, was able to bring down Jim Crow at the University of Georgia. A very momentous decision. Now, Constance Baker Motley had very harsh words for Walden as a result of his foot dragging in that case. She described Walden as, quote, a skilled and highly respected lawyer, but, quote, a typical upper-class Southerner. By her account, Walden's style was, quote, soft-spoken, non-aggressive, and exceedingly polite, and ineffective for piercing the wall of segregation. In other words, he was an accommodationist. Finally, Walden was viewed as an accommodationist because he, along with men like Martin Luther King Sr., who was the father of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and other pragmatists opposed direct action. Uh, the tactics of the students who burst onto the national scene in 1960. Their mantra was freedom now. Here they're shown in 1964, uh, challenging, uh, engaged in a demonstration. Um, they were not interested in pragmatism. They weren't interested in incrementalism. They needed lawyers to represent them. They turned to a new generation of the black bar uh, for help. Those people included uh, those lawyers who are pictured here, and you see uh, between these lawyers, uh, uh, Howard Moore Jr. Uh, is there and Don Hollowell, a smiling student who has been released from jail as a result of uh, their representation. These are skilled lawyers. Um, Hollowell was called George's Mr. Civil Rights. Uh, he represented plaintiffs in Heart of Atlanta Hotel versus the United States, which of course is the Supreme Court decision where uh, the court upheld the public accommodations title of the Civil Rights Act. Howard Moore won Bond versus Moore which, at the Supreme Court, which is a Vietnam era First Amendment case uh, upholding the First Amendment rights of elected officials. So these are tremendous lawyers and allies of the Civil Rights Movement. Now, after I've told you all of this evidence uh, going against my thesis, uh, you must want to know why I stand pat uh, on my claim that Walden uh, should not necessarily be viewed as uh, an accommodationist of segregation. And I must say that um, over the course of writing this book, I've had quite a few people uh, say to me that, well, Walden really doesn't belong in your book. They're very happy to know that I've uh, written the histories of uh, these unsung lawyers, uh, but uh, I've had people like my dear uh, constitutional law professor Owen Fiss at Yale, who is a great student of the Warren Court, uh, tell me, how can you include this man in your book? He doesn't understand how anyone who didn't agree with the Warren Court could possibly be considered uh, a civil rights lawyer. Uh, and he says he was no Thurgood Marshall, and indeed he was not. But still, I argue for a bigger tent, for the inclusion of Walden in the history of dissenters from the racial status quo. And that's for a number of reasons. 
First, I would argue that his exclusion reflects scholars' use of the NAACP and its integrationist uh, philosophy as a measuring stick. In other words, the charge of accommodationism is not so much an interpretation, it's conclusory. Um, it reflects the fact that the NAACP's view is now mainstream. It's not a scholarly analysis, and that's my aspiration. Second, it seems from my perspective that the pragmatist ideas actually pointed to legitimate weaknesses in the NAACP's desegregation strategy. The pragmatists were indicating that desegregation did not fully address the harms of Jim Crow and slavery. In particular, they were indicating that it didn't speak to matters of class and culture. And when one considers um, later criticisms of the NAACP strategy of school desegregation in particular, which were lodged by people across the ideological spectrum, uh, I think one can appreciate that these point of view are worthy of consideration. It's also important to note that the social science literature of the late 1960s and 1970s and beyond, and the legal literature also emphasized points that resonate with the ideas of the pragmatists. And what are those points? They argue that formal rules changes without attention to culture and class uh, are inadequate. In other words, uh, constitutional rights are limited by external constraints. And it strikes me that the desire to exclude the perspectives of the pragmatists like Walden actually reflects a failure to appreciate that point, how difficult it is uh, for the courts to actually change society. And I think that one could appreciate those points while also conceding that the pragmatists may have been self-interested. They were prescient, but also self-interested at the same time. Third, the pragmatist views place the Supreme Court uh, history in a more accurate light. They help to, uh, us to see how civil rights precedents were perceived on the ground and how they actually played out on the ground, as opposed to how they look in law reporters. So take the case of Shelley versus Kramer as an example. Mm -hmm. Now, when that case was decided, the black press initially reported and this is a headline, Supreme Court says you can live anywhere. Uh, now, we lawyers know that the court ruled no such thing. In fact, it was a very minimal precedent saying that judges couldn't enforce racially restrictive covenants. Well, Walden knew this too. Um, he also knew that following Shelley, federal courts consistently ruled against the NAACP when it brought cases trying to expand the reach of Shelley versus Kramer. And importantly, these cases that the NAACP lost were in places like New York and Pennsylvania. So in Stuyvesant Town in New York on the Lower East Side, uh, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, in Levittstown. So this is Main Street, USA. Um, the NAACP lost these cases despite having model plaintiffs. So in the New York case, it was black veterans. Uh, they could not get support from the uh, liberal uh, mayor at the time, LaGuardia, who refused to intervene politically to support uh, the uh, veterans who wanted to live in uh, the uh, housing development there. And so what I'm saying is that A.T. Walden, uh, who was there looking at the situation, could see what was going on. Um, why should he have wanted to challenge uh, segregation in Atlanta when he could see that the NAACP uh, was losing its cases up north? Now, the NAACP did win some of its cases post-Shelley, uh, 
but ultimately it took Congress to open up access to housing in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. Thus, what I'm saying is that exclusion of the so-called accommodationist is a part of the mythology about the Supreme Court um, and the presumably great role that it played in advancing racial uh, equality. In fact, um, the story about the court and civil rights is much more nuanced as uh, some have written. Fourth and finally, it's this interpretation of Walden as a pragmatist that actually opened up my mind to a much broader, deeper, and synthetic, of, synthetic interpretation of civil rights history overall. So thinking of Walden as a pragmatist led me to this question. Who else is out there that we could not see as historians and constitutional scholars um, because of our present heroes? So what other lawyers didn't fit inside of the NAACP box? Uh, maybe because they didn't agree with Marshall or maybe because uh, they were not uh, the heroes like Marshall. Um, and I ended up discovering Don Hollowell and Howard Moore because I could see A.T. Walden. So the embrace of the diversity of perspectives was a great intellectual gift, it turned out. So I would conclude that this bottom-up perspective on constitutional history uh, shows that a whole range of figures were law shapers and law interpreters, along with the legendary Thurgood Marshall. Walden is just one of many people whom we ought to remember, one of many legal professionals uh, from whom we can learn. Each of these lawyers, in his own way, helped to move society forward, to create a more vibrant democracy. These lawyers, who were all descendants of slaves, have been excluded from the political community, but they laid claim to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and they gave meaning to Jefferson's ideal that all men are created equal. I think that's a history lesson that should endure. Thank you.